21 convention. And the 21 convention is about the ideal man and shaping that ideal man. And I know from my own journey, what I discovered through this was so much, a whole new world of diet, exercise, and fitness. It, it changed my life. And it actually, it's the one thing that I've seen change so many attendees and even speakers' lives. So right now, we actually have a PhD in exercise physiology and biomechanics, also 21 convention speaker alumni, all the way from the UK to the US to speak for you guys. We have Mr. James Steele. Let's see. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and take a little sip of water first. Just apologize. My throat's been a bit sore this week, so hopefully my voice holds out for the whole of the talk. Um, okay, just to give you a bit of an overview of what the talk's going to be about and the purpose of the talk. Um, for those of you who have seen it already, I, I, I've given this talk before. This is the second time I've given it. Um, but I've got a bit more time to go into a bit more detail and try and conceptualize some of the ideas, uh, a bit more, make them a bit more contextual for you guys here. So... Um, the title of the talk is uh, A Synthesis of Modern Exercise Physiology and Evolutionary Theory. And uh, to start off with, I'm just going to go through and kind of explain what my thinking was and uh, what the purpose of the talk was about, what, what brought me to actually want to discuss this topic in a bit more detail. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to warn you guys, this is going to be a bit of a change of tact for um, what you've experienced for the most of the day. This is going to be quite an academic talk, so uh, expect a lot of references, citations, I'm going to make sure you're all taking notes, and I'm going to pass a quiz out at the end. So uh, you'll get your grades back uh, by Sunday. OK, so let's get started. Ooh, if the clicker wants to work. There we go. Right, OK. So the talk's going to cover this idea of kind of evolutionary fitness or paleo fitness. The whole kind of uh, paleo idea has become very, very popular within the lay press and the academic sphere over the last few years. I mean, everyone here has probably heard of the paleo diet. Hands up if you've heard of the paleo diet. There we go, that's pretty much everyone. Okay, so it, it's got a lot more momentum, it's become a lot more popular, and something that's kind of rolled up in the whole idea of a paleo diet has been this idea of paleo fitness as well. So the idea that we should be uh, exercising in an evolutionary, evolutionarily congruent manner. Um, and this has been, becoming more and more popular in the lay press. So we've got various books, we've got MoveNat, CrossFit, although um, I'm, we're going to have to sort of pretend that if the clicker works. There we go. Pretend I didn't say uh, CrossFit because apparently they're actually suing the NSCA at the moment. So we'll pretend I wasn't talking about CrossFit just in case this comes back to bite me in the ass. So, uh, but anyway, it's been very, very popular in terms of the lay press and the academic sphere recently. Um, there's been a number of uh, review papers covering the idea that we should be exercising like our evolutionarily, uh, evolutionary ancestors. We should be exercising in a paleo or evolutionary fitness type approach. And there's some justification for this. If the clicker wants to go. There we go, right. And there's some justification for this. So, if you've read any of the literature or you've familiarized yourselves with the works of guys like uh, Lauren Cordain, Rob Wolf, you tend to see that the same few studies are trotted out over and over and over again to support the idea that hunter-gatherers, evolutionary man, was fit, robust, healthy, fast, strong, had good body composition, low body fat, good hip to waist ratio, so on and so forth. And you get given this very romantic picture of what hunter-gatherers look like. Now, what I wanted to do was actually go back into the literature and look at it with a bit more of a sober perspective, a bit more skepticism, and see whether or not the whole body of literature actually supported this view. Because I didn't necessarily think that this was just all there was to see. These are only a few studies, so I wanted to go in and see whether or not the whole of the literature actually supported this viewpoint. So, as I said, I think this is a bit of a romantic view. So let's just cover physical activity in general quickly. So we all know that physical activity is beneficial to our health and well-being, our fitness. And we know that physical activity, it protects against all cause mortality and morbidity in a dose response type manner. So the more we're physically active, the more we see a reduction in our risk for all cause mortality and different morbidities. But recently, 
studies have started to question whether or not the volume of activity, i.e. how much we're active, actually provides the benefits that we think it does. And we've started to find that actually the intensity of effort involved in the activity, so how hard the exercise actually is, seems to provide a much more powerful benefit. So if we're exercising in a more intense manner, we tend to see significantly greater reductions in all-cause mortality and survival statistics. And this ties up actually as well with studies that show that physical fitness parameters seem to be even stronger predictors of all-cause mortality health and well-being. So for example, VO2 max is one of the strongest predictors of cardiac disease, morbidity and mortality as well. We tend to see that VO2 max is higher in the obese yet metabolically healthier, healthy and lower in those who are normal weight but metabolically obese. Even strength and muscle mass are significant predictors of health and well-being and reduced all-cause mortality. So it seems to be that actually what's more important is the intensity of the activity. And this is what modern exercise physiology is starting to support. So what I wanted to do was actually take some of these concepts and go back and look at the literature regarding our evolutionary past and what our physical activity patterns were in that evolutionary past. So in terms of evolutionary fitness recommendations, in general we're asking the question, what should we do? Now, up until now, authors have based the answer to that question on two other questions. So they've either looked at the evolved traits determining our physical activity limitations and capacities, i.e. asking what can we do, what are we evolved for, what adaptations do we have that permit us to involve ourselves in certain activities, and what are the limitations to those uh, activities. Or what did we do in terms of what were the physical activity patterns and physical activity levels of extinct and extant hunter-gatherers. And this is what most of the literature has based its ideas on. So what I wanted to do was go through and actually try and answer those questions in order to provide a an answer to the question of what should we be doing in terms of exercise? What does the research actually support? So what this is going to do is provide an, a synthesis of the modern exercise physiology research with research into evolutionary physical activity patterns in order to provide an answer of what we should be doing. Now, I just want to provide a bit of a kind of limitation on this because I'm coming at it from the perspective that Physical fitness seems to be a very strong predictor of health and well-being. So although, yes, there may be other arguments for taking part in certain physical activities for other outcomes, I'm going to focus the talk on what's the best way and what should we be doing to actually promote physical fitness? Because that seems to be one of the strongest predictors of all-cause mortality and morbidity. I also want to make the point that, obviously, Within our evolutionary past, physical activity was directed towards survival, whereas today we have the luxury that we don't have to be physically active. Instead, we have to directly engage in exercise in order to achieve these outcomes that we're interested in. So I want to differentiate between physical activity in terms of general and occupational physical activity as opposed to exercise, i.e. recommendations as to what we should be doing to actually achieve these outcomes. This is going to slow me down. Am I not pressing the button hard enough? There we go. Right. So the question is, what exercise should we be doing? So the outline of the presentation is going to answer the questions of what can we do, what did we do, what should we do, and then try and provide some conclusions and recommendations. So in terms of what can we do, I want to look at the activity repertoire that our bodies have actually evolved for. What sort of activities can we do? Now, it doesn't necessarily answer whether we should do them, though, but some answer to that question will help lead us towards an answer of what should we do. I also want to look at what did we do. So I want to look back into the past at other primate species, at extinct hunter-gatherers, and at extant hunter-gatherer populations that are still around to see what their physical activity patterns and levels were actually like, to try and provide some sort of answer. And then finally, what I want to do is actually synthesise that with the exercise physiology literature and what that currently suggests in terms of what's best in terms of exercise recommendations. <clears throat> okay, so, to start off with then, what activity repertoire have we actually evolved and adapted for? Now, there's a few things we need to keep in mind when we're talking about evolutionary adaptations. And I'm going to take some concepts from Dan Lieberman here with regards to evolutionary adaptation. So what is an adaptation? So in terms of evolution, an adaptation is a useful feature that's been shaped by natural collection, uh, selection that promotes survival and reproduction. So it's important to differentiate between what we mean by physical fitness, which I've been referring to up until now, and reproductive fitness. So 
An evolutionary adaptation is something that promotes reproductive fitness, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it promotes our physical fitness or our health and our well-being. In today's society, physical uh, reproductive fitness is more heavily influenced by a number of other factors. So we're differentiating between adaptations in terms of evolutionary fitness or reproductive fitness and adaptations that might promote physical fitness. Because not all ancestral adaptations are good for us, but conversely, not all modern adaptations are bad for us. So it's important to keep that in mind as well. So what sort of things are we actually evolved for? Well, bipedalism is clearly something that we've adapted for. We're all bipedal. Everyone can stand up if they want to. Everyone can walk out of the room. Heck, most people can run if they want to. So we've clearly evolved for bipedalism. Now, in a talk I did a few years ago, I actually talked a bit about the emergence of bipedalism. So what sort of stages we went through. We started off as arboreal quadrupeds. We went through a stage where we evolved into more semi-terrestrial quadrupedalism when we look at great ape locomotor patterns. Whereas today, we're now habitual bipeds. And that was accompanied by a number of different adaptations, including changes in the lumbar and pelvic structure and changes in the hip and uh, lumbar and hip musculature as well. And there are a number of other documented adaptations relating to our ability to be bipedal. They include a neutral ligament to keep the head upright when we're moving bipedally. We have changes in our morphology for our Achilles tendon, providing more elastic energy to help with locomotion. And there are a number and a host of other adaptations, too many to go through in this, in this presentation. Now, the reasons for us evolving bipedalism are many. They involve changes in our environment, increased ability to obtain food, avoiding preda predation. It increased our cost uh, or reduced our uh, energy savings for cost of transport, but not necessarily for running. So there were many pressures involved in determining bipedalism as an evolutionary adaptation. And as I said, a number of adaptive advantages to, to that. So being bipedal meant that we were upright, it increased our visual field. It reduced our cost of transport, which meant that we could walk further throughout the day. It also increased our ability to firm and regulate. Standing upright meant there was more wind that could uh, help reduce our body temperatures. We also experienced much less solar radiation as well. And obviously, standing upright frees your hands for tool use as well. So there are a number of advantages for being bipedal. It's clear we have evolved to be bipedal. But that doesn't necessarily imply that being bi bipedal should dictate what types of exercise we should be doing. Now, our upper body physical capacity has significantly and dramatically altered as well. We've obviously lost a lot of the specialization for our boreal type quadru quadrupedalism and our boreal locomotion. Now, if we look at the capacity in terms of our upper body in early humans, we see that they were typically quite heavily muscled. That may be down to the fact that hafted levers weren't available at that time, so we needed greater physical capacity. But it's very difficult to determine whether or not we were more muscular because of the environment, or whether or not we adapted to be more muscular. And you tend to see as well, there's, there is a general reduction in the musculature that's coincident with greater tool specialization. So as we've gone through our evolutionary history, we've typically lost a lot of our physical capacity. But as I said, it's difficult to determine whether that's an evolutionary adaptation or actually just a reflection of our physical activity patterns. A final thing to note in terms of what we've adapted for. Our body is highly plastic. It tends to respond to the demands that we place on it. The capacity that we have broadly matches those demands. The body doesn't want to waste anything. So unless you place a specific demand on it, it doesn't want to invest resources in actually producing adaptations. So in fact, our bodies being a plastic system was an evolutionary adaptation for energy savings in the first place. So it's important to realize that we are an adaptive species in terms of our body's plasticity. It will respond in a number of ways to the stimuli that it experiences. But again, that's quite general. It's very difficult to draw recommendations from that. OK, so let's move on then to what were the physical activity patterns in our evolutionary past. We know kind of what we're adapted for. We're bipedal. We're not as muscular as we used to be. We're not as specialized in terms of our upper body locomotion abilities. We can use tools. We've adapted those types of specializations. But it doesn't really tell us a lot in terms of drawing exercise recommendations from that. Now, maybe if we look at the physical activity patterns in our evolutionary past, we might be able to draw out some specific activities that we did involve ourselves in, or at least how active we were. 
Now, typically, most studies have looked at the energy expenditure of physical activity and tried to draw recommendations from that. So they've broadly kind of said, well, extinct and extant hunter-gatherers, they were pretty active, so we should be more active. Well, that's great. But that doesn't give you any specificity in terms of recommendations. How should I be more active? Should I run? Should I lift weights? Should I bike? Should I swim? Should I row? It doesn't really provide a lot of information. It just tells you you should be more physically active.